So the word just is a complicated word. On the one hand, it evokes systems of administering justice, of adjudicating right and wrong, and doling out punishments. It also points to movements against established norms, fights for new values, and conceptions of the just. But it's also a lighter word. It's about throwaway things. Just kidding. Just for the hell of it. Just one of those days. It speaks of play, of looseness, of tossing rules aside. And in architecture, the obsession with the just so, the precision of line weights, of material connections, of structural systems, brings a kind of pleasure and play in an OCD sort of way, but also points to value systems inside and outside of the discipline. With the word just, we wanted to intentionally collide themes of justice, play, and precision. As is a tradition with the Architectural League Prize, a committee of recent awardees, as Anne mentioned, chooses the topic. So along with Anya Sirota of Akiyoki in Detroit and Isabel Abascal of Lanza Atelier in Mexico City, we came up with this idea and had the pleasure of working with Mario, um, Juliet, and Paul, as was mentioned, on the selection of winners. Our aim was to explore the range of practices that address the urgencies of our moment, particularly the social, political, environmental urgencies that confront us. This can sometimes feel like a dark time, one that demands a dramatic rethinking of the aims and means of the profession. But it also requires the full arsenal of architectural skills, not only spatial intelligence and planning, but also the capacity for inventing new business models, new methods of engagement, and new forms of joy. While there have historically been divisions, if not antagonisms, between politically driven practices and those focused on form and representation, we are excited about a new generation of practitioners who are bursting out of these categories. The practices that you will see tonight and tomorrow merge design innovation and spatial engagement, social engagement. They treat the tools of the profession as embedded in socio-political contexts and deploy them with effusive and thoughtful play. They communicate faith that the field with its obsessions and its pleasures will have impact beyond itself. In sending out this call, we discovered an even richer array of practices than we expected. The six winners encompass a wide range of approaches to the theme from those that directly address social justice through activism and collaboration with local community organizations to those that explore how the techniques of architecture are intertwined with latent cultural values and social effects. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce three of the winners, Mira Hassan Henry of Henry Architecture, Jennifer Bonner of Mall, and Cyrus Penaroyo of Extense. These three winners in particular explore how architectural tools of representation, form making, and materiality are entangled with larger cultural narratives and contexts. By hacking these tools and redeploying them to surprising ends, they highlight how the just so's of architecture have social agency. So to start with, Mira is first, yes? Okay. Um, Mira Hassan Henry is principal of Henry Architecture based in Los Angeles and design faculty at Southern California Institute of Architecture, or SciArc. She also co coordinates the DID summer outreach program for high school students at SciArc. Before starting her practice, Mira earned her master's in architecture at UCLA and worked at Monica Ponce Leon Studio and Office DA. Her own practice, Henry Architecture, combines experimental and speculative projects with built work, including her recent exhibition, Rough Coat, at the SciArc Gallery. Her work grapples with established formal and material techniques in architecture, insisting that any method is entangled in the politics of its time and place. As she describes eloquently in her portfolio statement, quote, formal technique, material experimentation, and representation are cross-cut and interrupted by the quotidian circumstances that surround any given project, its context, who makes it, how it is made, and the way it is publicly consumed. In this case, formal ideation is implicitly informed by and bound up in contemporary concerns of race, gender, and desire. In order to traverse these often siloed topics, I, as in Mira, explore tactics that privilege attention to mundane details, coincidence of association, and the mildly absurd. So with that, I hear from you, Mira. Um, I framed this lecture in two parts. Um, part one, walking and talking, um, which is a series of ambulatory reflections in which I will attempt to lay out a set of terms, tactics, and values. And part two, coats and beds, I will show briefly a particular project I did this past year called Rough Coat for the SciArc Gallery. Sorry. 
Um, uh, the title of the talk, Gentle Nudge, Cutting Look on the Tactics of Interrupting the Normal Vibe, comes from the statement I wrote from this competition. It's an attempt to get at the methods for working that allow for layered formalism on my own terms. Um, this is one um, that contains both deep criticality and optimism. Um, uh, so I'd like to begin with a story of description that takes place um, uh, up the street from where I live. <clears throat> at the corner of Jefferson Boulevard in Arlington in Los Angeles. For those of you that may or may not know Los Angeles, uh, this is a spot about half a mile south of the 10 freeway um, in the historic neighborhood of Jefferson Park. It's primarily a working class black and Latino neighborhood. Uh, and due to the high quality of the housing stock, however, and the rather central location of, um, in the city, it has also become a hot place for new affluent and mostly white buyers. In this way, the intersection um, is like many urban moments in Los, Angeles, in Los Angeles and around the country, full of cultural overlap and transformation. The building on the right um, is a hulking, square structure, painted white with a curly crown. It's one of my favorite buildings in the city. It sits discreetly on the corner, couched within a collection of buildings that carry their own particular character in both appearance and use. Uh, there's the stout pink fourplex to the right. <clears throat> its narrow front yard has been the site of many birthday party castles and graduation tents, filling the tight site even further to the brim with a colored themed party rental supplies. There's the Burger Palace with its iconic super hat roof, an even more iconic super sign advertising a cultural pastiche of offerings, pastrami, chicken, burritos, tacos, and fresh press carrot juice, just check it out. Um, and beyond, on the other side of Arlington is a strip mall painted yellow with red accents, as if the color palette of the Burger Palace jumped the street and inverted. Um, here, there's a beauty supply store, a liquor store, a cell phone store, and the famous Louisiana fried chicken Chinese food and donuts. <laughs> Bookending the complex is an extra deep Botress building with a fancy marquee front. It's an old neighborhood theater turned pawn shop, among other things notable for the way in which the scale and eclecticism of the typography pile up and fill the frame of the facade. Crude, elegant, and confident, all in one. The building that is the object of my obsession sits between all these formal and informal layers that make up the context. It is the church, it is a church, uh, Iglesia de Jesucristo de Canaan Central. A tent on the side is the kitchen. The building is mostly a generic stucco box, flat on two sides with unremarkable openings. Here, though, we, see, we can see, that this, there, they see the seam that separates the generic from the specific. Framing the large picture windows with steel mullions is a thick cast concrete ornamental layer. From the oblique view, we can see the substantial thickness of the outer cladding. With the windows blanked out by the maroon and gold cloth on the interior, any other spatial depth is denied. Instead, our voyeuristic view is left ping-ponging between the micro layers of the curb and the curtain. Let me return, though, to this idea of the curly crown. I've always thought that the ornamental cast facade gave the building a strange, near anthropomorphism. That building has curly hair, I would say to myself, much like the exclamation of a child when she identifies something familiar out in the world. The building was built in 1928. More typical of that era in LA are hand, hand car facades with delicate, intricate ornamentation. In contrast, this uber filigree takes on more presence than simply a layer of confection. It's less curly Q and more curl, big, heavy, and full. Undeniably for me, an art history undergrad student in the late 90s, to raise the subject of any curly locks, I can't not invoke Lorna Simpson and her canonical piece, Wigs, Portfolio, from 1994. For those less familiar with the piece, it's a collection of wigs that are varied and particular in style. The photographs are printed on a thick off-white felt, giving the images themselves a woolly material presence. Interspersed with the images are fictional texts that conjure meanings that range wildly from the history of slavery to drag. The near anthropomorphism, or more broadly, this idea of the figure and character of building, 
uh, building form has been on my mind for some time. This slide of a drawing by 18th century French architect Jacques-Francois Blondel has been a part of my lecture for several years. So is this one, Godfrey Semper's 19th century iconic drawing of the Caribbean hut. Uh, but in putting this lecture together, I felt that it was important for me to address head on the complexity I felt with working from these historical models. <clears throat> Blondel's etchings are clear. In true humanist fashion, he uses the facial profile as a formal defense for the proportions of a cornice detail. These are idealized white Western figures, of course. This is his context of beauty. There's a young man, an old man, and a maiden. The system of representation in the drawing shows an overlay of a conceptual notion and building form. Ultimately, the building is an abstraction of the human figure. The body, in this case, is a specter within the construction of an architectural idea. For Semper, 100 years later, the drawings of the Caribbean hut demonstrate his four elements of architecture, the hearth, the roof, the enclosure, and the mound. This position comes out of an anthropological and colonial form of analysis of indigenous craft and techniques which is typical of the 19th century. The particularities of this hut, however, we know very little about. While it's called the Carib hut, is effectively rendered an ahistorical and culturally neutralized model in service of an architectural principle. The form of representation in this case makes the specter of the human figure far easier to ignore. By this, I mean the colonial body and the history of violence it represents is purged from this view. As a point of, rent, point of reference, Semper is working during the time of the Great Exhibition, 1851. This is an early modern moment and a height of Western imperialist power. We're also, let's not forget, hundred year, hundreds of years into slavery, which incites the African diaspora that has formatively and effectively shaped culture as we know it. In this illustration, human beings from colonized nations stand side by side, um, new industrial artifacts and taxidermy. Um, these are the wonders of the modern world as consumed by Western culture. I'm not producing this new, as new information, we know this. We also know that in the 19th century, during the formation of the modern subject, there were human zoos, famous in France, Belgium, and Germany, a practice that last, lasted into the mid 20th century. I think about Blondel's pure former overlay of him and human figure to building, and Semper's layering system that blocks out the memory of the subject. Perhaps we can also think about these images, these ones, which show the human figure, the building, and the landscape um, as, a, as a collapse of many layers, and in this case, of power, exotification, exploitation, and violence. And so we arrive here with Loos and his principles of cladding and his house for Josephine Baker in the 1920s. We have a building with black and white stripes and an insanely voyeuristic interior designed with a single woman in mind, a light-skinned black performer from St. Louis that is, um, who traveled to, to Paris to and capture the imagination of an entire generation. So it is by now I hope you can begin to anticipate why I'm both attracted and repulsed by this project. It is the metaphorical Freudian slip in modern architecture. It demonstrates the wildly racialized and gendered nature of the building skin in the context of modern architecture. Um, this is a photo um, on the right is, um, is Le Corbusier and Josephine Baker at a costume ball on a cruise in 1929. It was a very famous moment for Le Corbusier. <clears throat> she is in white face, dressed as Pierrot, and he as a prisoner uh, or jailbird in black and white stripes. Um, and framing the image on the right is an unknown man who grins back at us in blackface. Last year, I took this picture of the building on Arlington and Jefferson Boulevard. This was before the church repainted it and put, put up fresh curtains. I wanted to capture this fleeting moment in which the Why Am I Jeans campaign, Want a Better Butt, was displayed in front of the curly-haired building. The image is of a woman at one-to-one -one scale positioned as if she's lying on the bus stop um, bench. The LA-based jean company developed the jeans from, for, with more room for curves for black and Hispanic women. Um, and the objectification of female body aside, this woman is fierce. <laughs> She's amazing. <laughs> she stares straight back at you and is untouchable. I think about Manet's Olympia, or perhaps Laurent, the Afro-Brazilian French immigrant that lived in Manet's building 
uh, Afro-Brazilian French immigrant that did live in Manet's building and posed for him for this painting and in many others. She's in the dark, in the background. Um, but what I like about this image, or the idea of this image, is that it both refers to and breaks that historical model. The brown female body is neither in the dark nor erased, and here, in the facade, the possibility of an aesthetic project may be evident. We get a hint of how forms of abstraction may elevate her locks to the monumental scale of a building. So I return to this idea of the wig and cladding, this time thinking of Ellen Gallagher's wig drawings, which are haunting and tactile and radically confident. Um, and Lorna Simpson's recent wigged collages that take, up, that take us to a place that is color-soaked and swirled. It is one that shows us a model of how we may layer up things that are wildly beautiful, playful, and cutting. This is what I would describe as an exalted formalism. So with a lightness in my step, I turn from my spot in the corner, and I'm on the hunt to take a picture, a couple of pictures of some new houses that keep catching my eye. There's this amazing house um, that floors me every time I see it, all painted in light purple with dark purple trim. The dark tinted windows from the, um, form bold black squares, and on either side sit puffy pom-pom bushes with new growth green that is so electric that it makes everything pop. And then there is this brooding house, all in brown, buttoned up, retreating in every way. And these two sit side by side as if colluding to see which house can be more color saturated and vibrant. The sheer shock of color that each offer is one um, is only made more impressive by this silver foil window finish that lurks deep in the frame. I think about this notion of the specter of the subject as I admire the beauty and subtle or not so subtle swag of these homes. How, I wonder, can I share this sense of exaltation that I feel with other folks? Part two, coats and beds. In October 2018, I installed a project called Rough Coat in the Sci Art Gallery. The project grew out of this work, um, the work that I've been doing walking around South LA and surveying houses. On the left is a photograph of one of the many houses I documented while looking at the material expression of privacy. Bushes, awnings, eaves, cladding, shutters, windows, window tinting, blinds, and drapery were all pushed into a narrow zone that creates a thick layer that would in all cases divide the exterior and the interior. On the right is an image of a painting by Carrie James Marshall called Nude Spotlight in 2009. It's an arresting image, one of freedom and, intimacy and the intimacy of the interior. It also demonstrates the way in which Marshall is a master at working, um, as a master, first of all, <laughs> and um, at how, how to render darkness and to render skin. I describe the project Rough Coat as a facade scaled blanket. It's a literal coming together of the softness and informality and intimacy of the interior and the structured cladding of a house that must do an entirely different type of work, namely protect and conceal. And I took cues from Marshall and chose to work in the dark, so to speak. This is the entry to the gallery. You can see the walls are all painted in near black brown tone. The text on the door addresses the viewer. Dear visitor, this is a pretty easy going show. Feel free to touch the blankets and lie down on the beds. The gallery was organized in, as an interior landscape with a large blanket draped over a frame and two large beds on either side. Um, in this image on the left, you can see that the blanket is, is gaping open like a big picture window and the two beds, one on the, in the foreground and one in the background, produce the effect of spatial mirroring. The blanket is an 18 foot by 18 foot, um, 18 foot by 18 foot piece, and is designed as a panelized system that I fabricated with a group of students. Um, the panels were developed as an idea, uh, with an idea of scale in mind, so they were light enough for one person to pick up, but a bit too big um, uh, to assemble without working together. The project is an experiment in working with two things that seem to not really go together very well. Open cell upholstery foam and building grade stucco. One element clearly referring to an interior language of detailing, and the other a conventional exterior siding material. With these, our two principal substrates, we, were working on, we worked on layering it, coating it, sewing it, stuffing it, and tufting it. 
um, such that in the end, the legibility of the project hovered in a strange place between that which we know well and something quite alien and absurd. I was interested in the sort of mixed sensibility of the material, that it is pliable and inviting, and yet the roughness of the coat felt a little wrong and a bit uncomfortable. Um, I invited folks um, for a series of close um, photo sessions um, and documented friends and um, documented by a, a really talented friend of mine named Tia Thompson. Um, it was really amazing, um, some really amazing times uh, doing this work. Um, during those, these events, um, we, were, we asked people to just let loose and mess around with the material. Um, and the photos I'll show you um, are uh, document some of the, the range of playfulness and awkwardness and sometimes intimacy of these interactions. The tectonic question of how things come together and the interaction between surface and structure plays out through a notion of um, aesthetic empathy, this idea of empathy. Um, in a, even in, a, in, the th in thinking about tectonics. So the blanket drapes and the structure bends and people and material are all kind of come together and take up space and let loose a little. A note on color. Um, so when I brought the piece into the gallery, it had a really, a, was really awful because the lights were so bright that they effectively flattened the texture um, and they undermined the notion of tonal variation and gradation they were working on. So we had to do a lot of work to bring the light levels and the temperature to a place where the material felt, the material even felt visible. Um, so you can see here, there's the lights are turned way down. Um, and, uh, and in this case, that black brown tone of the wall starts to kind of uh, become green through its association, a sort of fugitive way in relationship to the piece in front. Um, and thinking about Marshall and his paintings um, in the dark um, and the way that he renders skin, um, uh, the project worked to bring out the subtle dis the distinction in tone and texture of the blankets as well as the people in the space. So the palette was based loosely off of this, uh, the, the idea of abstraction of skin tones and the landscape. So basically three colors, a brown, a green, and then a really hot yellow just to wake it all up. Um, I want to close um, just with one, a one-minute clip or 45-second clip of a conversation I had uh, recorded in the space with a dear friend of mine um, and colleague, Victor Jones. Um, in many ways, when I was working on this project, I was fumbling to figure out a way to dis disrupt the normal vibe and utter an architectural idea through my own lived experience. Um, Victor was the first one to help point that out to me, and, and for that, I want to thank him. Okay, I attempt to... So there, there's a sort of like, like just diehard resistance for, that I feel um, in, in working on, um, on that project of kind of the enclosure is to not, maybe not then extract and like pull away and try and extract, let's say, principles that are mm -hmm. like, like, like not make it about principles, mm -hmm. but like, let's just do it. Let's mm -hmm. just like, let's make it, let's, let's no, make, I mean, let's, let's, is, let's, let's make a blanket. There is a bit of a Uma Thurman Kill Bill scenario here, which is like come out <laughs> swinging and hitting at uh -huh. all things that have not allowed a certain I like that. visibility uh -huh. in the in the in the discipline or in the in the kind of privileging certain ways of thinking. Yeah. And there seems to be very much a deliberate attitude towards I need space and I yeah. want space and, I, and, and no one's going to <laughs> give me this space, so I must claim it and take it. Yeah. Thank you, Mary and Jennifer. It's such a pleasure to hear about hear you talk about your work. Um, okay, so now Cyrus Peñarroyo is a partner of Extents and an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Before starting his own practice, he worked at Louis Sarmaki Lewis and OMA and earned his MRC at Princeton School of Architecture. Cyrus's portfolio stood out immediately for its radical rethinking of the tools of the discipline. In his own words, Cyrus explores, quote, the effects of contemporary media and digital culture on architecture, in particular how the circulation of images and the means behind their construction are reshaping the built environment. To do so, he produces viscerally evocative alternative worlds. 
The drawings and environments that Cyrus creates are entirely immersive in both their sensory affect and their destabilizing conceptions of bodies, subjects, and social interactions. The radicality of Cyrus's work is not only in its vivid world making, but in its implication that these mediated worlds are already intertwined with our present. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Rani, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to bookend my talk with a few thank yous. Um, first, thank you um, also to the Architectural League of New York, to Anne, Katerina, Sarah, and others for organizing this entire event, uh, and to the committee and jury for selecting me as one of this year's winners. Um, also, thank you to the team at Parsons for their help with the exhibition. Um, thank you to my friends and colleagues at Talman College of Architecture and Urban Planning for their continued support. Um, and to my partner in practice, McLean Clutter. <laughs> Um, only two years out from League Prize eligibility, I share this work and prize with you. It's a pleasure getting to work with you every day. And more importantly, thanks for being an incredible friend. Together, we run an architecture practice called Extents. Extents is a design collaborative that operates across scales and disciplinary silos. We're interested in architecture, urbanism, media, digital culture, and other instruments of life that can be impacted by design. Central to our practice is a commitment to architecture's role as a medium of public life, progressive culture, and common sense. And we deploy aesthetic devices and queer methods as a means of access to otherness. Our work cultivates alteric forms of collectivity, new forms of excess, unconventional tectonic assemblies that suggest alternative material cultures, and other ways of being in the world. As a practice, we're much more interested in unpacking the concerns around individual projects than committing to any singular capital P project or signature design technique. This means that we take on each design project through its own terms. We privilege the development of an, uh, we privilege the development of an orientation over ideology, unpacking physical and cultural contexts, and leveraging the latent opportunities or constraints that each project presents. This also means that we're commonly operating at the edge of what we know how to do. Individual projects require that we constantly take on new skills, softwares, design techniques, or collaborators. To that end, we've set up the practice as a sort of open relationship. The two of us are involved in everything we do to different degrees, but we value and seek out collaboration with other architects, designers, public partners, nonprofits, students, and academics that bring expertise and perspectives necessary for individual works and to expand the breadth and depth of the practice. This kind of open or ecological model for the practice means that concerns or affinities that span from project to project sometimes only become clear in retrospect, when looking back at what we've been doing and thinking over the past couple of years. Uh, the practice only started in 2017. So to frame this talk today, I looked back to pull out a few preoccupations that I think articulate a set of threads within our recent work. And those are media materiality, other urbanisms, digital culture, and critical engagement. We think that media and architecture are alike in their ability to frame collective experience. By focusing on the materiality of media, the physical stuff of media that constantly surrounds us, we seek to articulate this commonality and develop novel forms of occupation, ornamentation, and collective experience. Like media, we see urbanism as a technology for collective life. We're interested in urbanism as both product in the form of speculative urban design proposals and as a context that confronts architecture with all of the social and political concerns that attend the urban milieu. This interest in social and political contexts also extends to the digital sphere, as more and more of our lives are conducted online and in digital space. Our projects are often intended to anticipate their dissemination online or in social media, taking on the digital as a site for critical contextualism. And so, whether the site is digital or IRL, if that distinction even stands anymore, we hope our work prompts the questioning of occupation, interaction, material cultures, and all of the ways the built environment impacts those concerns. Um, I thought I would begin by really quickly showing previews of several recent projects, just to give you a sense of the scope of our practice and how the concerns um, I just discussed move through our work. And all of these projects are featured in more detail on our website. So first up, Shape Places speculates on the reciprocity between who we are and the shape of where we live, between identities and the built environments that support them. 
The project culminates in three linear cities, linear cities that propose ways that urbanization might be a tool to unite politically divided publics into one functional body politic. Um, and the exhibition featured paintings, drawings, and models and that were exhibited for the first time at Pink Comma Gallery in Boston. Um, next up is Assembly Lines, a, a proposal for a community space in Detroit that was meant to redirect the image of Detroit's industrial legacy towards the creative assembly of community infrastructure, grassroots publics, and counterpublics. The project is composed of a suite of graphic spatial parts that can be moved around um, uh, along a continuous linear track above to host a range of singular or collective occupancies from co-working to community design meetings. Other Island is a project that draws on a legacy spanning from Thomas More's Utopia to Kool Haas's New Welfare Island in which urban islands are a site for speculation, for alteric reprojections of received urban reality. In this case, the island is a mobile geologic object that would travel between world cities. The cladding is chromed and geometrically faceted in order to literally reflect a kind of mixed or distorted image of any city within its proximity back to the urban onlooker, soliciting speculation on other urbanisms. I explored similar material questions in a proposal for the 2018 Ragdale Ring competition. Uh, Reflections on the Lawn engages the yard as a rich cultural field, transforming turf into a theatrical landscape. The Lawn in this proposal is a place for playing out myths and fantasies, a disciplined sword where everyone's imaginations can run wild. Uh, Nude is a proposal for MoMA's Young Architects program uh, that I did with Staka Studio. Uh, this project cr draws a critical line between contemporary digital presence and the fundamental surface of human appearances, questioning how we are seen and all of the myriad ways that technology allows us to appear in a scene by staging what we refer to as a critical party that blurs the distinction between occupant and sonography. Nude is composed of various parts that approximate different kinds of skin and an augmented reality application that would have allowed users to sample images of their own skin throughout the installation. The resultant environment was meant to eschew conventional pieties around identity, sex, and sexiness, collectivity, and body politics. The Thrill of Threshold, or Circle Jerk, was a pavilion that questions the disciplinary significance of pavilions and their capacity for public engagement. In a way, the project is about the pointlessness of the pavilion, a call for the discipline to exit our echo chamber at a time of pressing social, ecological, and political concerns. Despite that, uh, we still design pavilions. Uh, <laughs> this pavilion was called Turn On, Tune In, um, a pavilion that illuminates our collective desensitization to media by repurposing the material stuff of media technology. In this case, we imagined scraping off and reusing the polarizing film from old discarded LCD screens, uh, and we were interested in the optical effects that could be created by layering and rotating individual pieces of film to bend light in multiple ways. And lastly, um, the materiality of the screen was similarly used in this exhibition design for last year's Becoming Digital conference at Talman College. Screens provide the material support for ruminations about data, authorship, identity, audience, and labor, prompting visitors to take a critical look at the technologies organizing their lives. So um, to expand on some of these ideas, I'll now discuss three projects in more detail. Uh, the first is Image Matters, a project that looks closely at the material implications of image making. Images are everywhere in contemporary culture. We constantly stare at screens composing images from thousands of illuminated pixels. Images circulate as data through fiber optic cable. Terabytes of images are stored in silicon in our devices and servers. We hold mental images in our brains, and our world is still, and increasingly, packed with images in the form of a range of photographic formats. Images constitute an increasing proportion of the stuff of everyday reality, and yet the matter of images remains underexplored. Our work engages a wide spectrum of theorists, designers, and practitioners from the arts, humanities, and sciences in order to investigate the materiality of images and their role in framing collective experience and the built environment. To do this, the project recovers the materially rich early photographic processes of the tintype. Now, many of you probably know what a tintype is, but for those who don't, it's an early photographic process that's very labor-intensive and entails the use of metallic substrates to host layers of chemical and physical reactions, eventually producing a direct positive photographic image. The resulting prints, um, some of which you can see here, um, 
these are ours at the bottom, um, have unique visual qualities. To contemporary audiences, they might appear strangely familiar, unmistakably photographic, and yet sufficiently distinct from the types of images most commonly circulated today to interrupt habitual consumption. And when I say that they're unmistakably photographic, I mean that they certainly constitute resemblances or similitude, but at the same time, they have visual qualities that are uniquely inherent to the photograph as a category of object. Tintypes have texture, depth, and thickness that give them heightened material presence, vastly exceeding that of the typical 5x7 snapshot or the ephemeral digital pic. So we see, t we see tintypes um, as image objects that evince familiar photographic effects while stubbornly refusing to cede their object quality to the realm of mere appearances. Our tintypes have been produced within an enormous occupiable camera named the Conditions Room, a fully functional sliding box camera with a lens and an operable focal length that was also designed to serve as a darkroom for the development of the images it captures and to open up to become a gallery space for the exhibition. The Conditions Room is itself a study of the material and spatial consequences of image making, engaging a long history of optical devices that render the process of image making materially and spatially palpable. It's built from dimensional lumber and clad in closed cell neoprene foam paneling. Particular attention was paid to the design and fabrication of the paneling details, which are purposefully over-articulated. They include a lot of double folds and redundancy to elevate the functional necessity of maintaining the light, uh, the light qualities required for our imaging process to the level of architectural expression. They're a sort of ornament, let's say. Aluminum reproductions of these details serve as the substrates for the final products of the first phase of, our pro of this project. Um, these substrates have been photosensitized through the tintype process, producing three-dimensional pieces displaying photographic impressions of digitally manipulated material textures. Uh, we're really interested in the relationships that emerged between the digital patterns we produced, which are seen on the left in black and white, uh, and the material consequences of the tintype process. Sometimes, both produced inconsistencies, blurs, or noise that appear surprisingly congruent, while at other times, the slick and seamless digital is in stark contrast to the physical and material constraints of our imaging process. In one sense, the prints are unmistakably photographic and familiar. In this way, the pieces are Instagram-ready, designed to insert themselves within the deluge of image circulation that sets the tempo of contemporary architectural production. But in another sense, our pieces are meant to resist habitual consumption. They confuse the flat and the thick, the 2D and the 3D, the digital and the archaic, all in order to check, disrupt, redirect, or slow down image circulation to secure moments of rare attention. And now I'll end with um, just a few shots of the conditions room, um, opened up to serve as the exhibition space for collectively viewing these, these image objects. So, uh, from images to internet, this next project explores the ubiquity and all-overness of another facet of contemporary media. Online on Site is a mapping-based research and design project that studies the digital divide in Detroit, proposing urban design scenarios that are rich with innovative ways to connect physically and virtually. And this research was prompted by two recent developments, the FCC's repeal of net neutrality and the Census Bureau's decision to move their data collection online for the 2020 survey. In both cases, for one to be counted, or let's say to exist, requires, a, requires access to digital technology, which is a problem for those unable to afford internet, computers, or smart devices. Detroit is one of many places in the United States where this digital inequity persists. As investors pour money into the residential and commercial development of areas like downtown and midtown, residents in marginalized neighborhoods lack access to, to digital infrastructure. Um, indeed, despite recent development, Detroit has the lowest rate of internet connectivity in the United States, excluding thousands of people from the opportunities for education, employment, and belonging afforded to those with the ability to get online, and exacerbating the economic precarity of many Detroiters. Referred to as digital redlining, some view disinvestment in digital infrastructure for less affluent non-white communities as commensurate to discrimination. Many of those affected are school-aged kids that need the internet to complete their homework, submit job applications, or simply socialize with their classmates. Various political and grassroots organizations, like Detroit's Equitable Internet Initiative, seen here, are working to build a robust digital ecosystem as urban development is increasingly influenced by broadband or wireless accessibility. To do this, the EII is establishing community mesh networks across the city. But what exactly is a mesh network? 
Well, typically, we access the internet via broadband, an enormous cable that connects our ISP, or internet service provider, with top-level internet exchanges. And that diagram is there on the left. Mesh networks, on the other hand, connect devices directly to each other, instead of going through a central point, which allows for more flexibility based on available bandwidth and storage. Since mesh networks are decentralized and non-hierarchical, the only way to shut down or disrupt a mesh is to turn off every node in the network, making them more resilient to interference. The nodes, referred to as community anchor sites, include schools, libraries, municipal buildings, and other stakeholders in the neighborhood with the resources, access to fiber, and willingness to form public-private partnerships. In a, in a community driven network architecture, factories, apartments, and houses are outfitted with different routers, turning buildings into access points for residents to get online. The placement of the routers is based on line of sight, um, seen here in the kind of hatched zone. Um, for the network to function, airspace has to be clear of obstructions, including trees and signage. Taller buildings can act as long span nodes to link different areas of the neighborhood, while shorter buildings can, dis can distribute Wi-Fi access to more locally, uh, can, can distribute Wi-Fi wi access more locally and allow people to connect with their phones, laptops, or tablets. In other words, mesh networks are highly attuned to the physical attributes of the urban environment. Heights, proximities, and materials play a pivotal role in the network success. So I began the project by mapping Detroit. First, charting fiber, fiber availability to show its consolidation in the downtown area. Potential community anchors like public libraries, religious institutions, schools, and Wi-Fi equipped eateries that could participate in a community mesh network. The number of internet service providers available to residents. Um, most of the city has three or less options. And uh, maximum download speed, which is remarkably slow. All of this data was examined in relation to the city's history of redlining, race distribution, median household income, unemployment rate, and youth population. After reviewing this data, three sites were chosen for design speculation, each revealing a different opportunity for a community-driven network architecture to exist. Each site is anchored by a public library noted on the maps with a pink plus. Uh, and the first site, seen here, is located in southwest Detroit and features religious institutions and locally owned businesses that together could form a possible mesh network. In my interviews with local high school students, I learned that many of them are, are actually advised to go to McDonald's for the 24-hour Wi-Fi access when they don't have internet at home, which is pretty outrageous. So this first site speculation reimagines McDonald's as a community anchor site. And this diagram shows line of sight for ideal connectivity with other nodes in this possible network. So an existing McDonald's is converted into what I refer to as the McNet Learning Center an educational space that provides computers, tutoring services, and workstations to students. An abandoned home just north of the site is replaced with communal uh, townhouses oriented towards the restaurant with shared outdoor spaces that transition from the commercial thoroughfare to the residential block. An urban farm is introduced to an adjacent lot, so the surrounding neighborhood and the restaurant have access to produce, a direct response to the McDonald's Corporation's recent attempts to offer healthier menu options and be more community-centered. And here's a view inside of the addition showing study areas that face a new uh, school bus drop off. The second site is located in northeast Detroit and is bisected by a major highway and next to a defunct golf course. Uh, and this, this same diagram shows line of sight from the public library and the abundance of trees in the area. Again, trees interfere with signal strength. So the neighborhood. Um, which has a significant amount of vacant land and housing, which if this, this is what it would look like um, if you were to just clear out all of the uh, vacant property. Um, the neighborhood is re-envisioned as a network defined by social and cultural programs. Unoccupied houses and industrial buildings are converted into religious institutions. Community centers, banks, and businesses are redistributed into residential blocks. And new housing types are developed with shared space and internet access in mind. As trees are cleared to maintain sight lines, and reduce Wi-Fi interference, the defunct golf course is transformed into an urban forest. So all of those trees kind of make their way over to, to the golf course. Here's a view of one of the new housing types, a ring of duplexes with shared porches that feed off uh, Wi-Fi from a central antenna. The third and final site is located in northwest Detroit along Grand River Avenue, a commercial thoroughfare lined with hair salons, markets, convenience stores, and automotive shops. 
Between three major anchor sites seen here in the neighborhood's potential mesh network, uh, I chose two blocks to develop as, community, as a community land trust where, where property lines are dissolved in favor of shared Wi-Fi and resources. So vacant buildings, um, shown in dark blue, are converted into computer-equipped daycares, greenhouses, and barbershops owned and managed by residents living in the area. Uh, the wing of an existing church is transformed into a tech hub where both seniors and youth can get online, and an adjacent community center will supply internet access to the blocks in addition to a nearby closed school that's sitting on dark fiber that can be reactivated. Um, cords and cables are consolidated into fiber optic berms that cut through the site, creating civic spaces for residents to gather in various ways. And here's a view of one of those berms that kind of cuts through um, next to the urban farm. All of the maps, uh, yeah, all of the maps uh, and proposals were compiled into videos that also featured my interviews with Detroit youth. Uh, these students shared how the internet influences their identities, daily routines, and expectations of the city. I also met with representatives from the Detroit Community Technology Project and the City of Detroit Mayor's Office and used what I learned from those conversations to develop the design proposals. The videos were presented in an exhibition alongside other projects mapping Detroit. And here, data points are literally materialized as what I refer to as content nodes within the gallery for visitors to engage. As the project is received by Detroiters, I hope it will create a heightened sense of community, empower citizens to create new spaces for public discourse in their neighborhoods, and redefine what digital access and equity could look like in the urban environment. The last project I'll talk about is Lossy Lossless, a temporary environment for materials and applications in Los Angeles. When M&A approached us about this project, it was explained that we would be the soft opening of a new space in Echo Park, which is a short drive from their old courtyard space in Silver Lake, seen here, and that our installation would be programmed with various community and organization activities throughout its duration. So we began by thinking about the urban context. It was interesting to us that this new space on Sunset Boulevard is located in a rapidly gentrifying part of Echo Park. And here's the building uh, and the storefront space in the lower right. Uh, we thought that this context posed a problematic that is familiar and recurrent uh, for a nonprofit's arts, arts organization, especially one dedicated to community engagement through public programming. So often, the presence of cultural and arts organizations are harbingers or even catalysts of gentrification, uh, even while their missions might be focused on community and public benefit. So we thought, that this project, we thought of this project as an opportunity to make a space for discussion around this complex issue. We wondered who constitutes the public in such a rapidly changing neighborhood? Can newcomer and longtime residents coexist? How are the politics of development impacting the existing community? And how can an arts organization address its role within such, uh, in such development? So again, this project sought to provide a forum for discussion on these questions and not to provide answers or verdicts. To do this, we wanted the storefront to feel like an extension of the street uh, and a space that is meant to be viewed from the passerby, like a diorama, as much as it, as much as it is meant to be uh, occupied. So we began with a kind of Google Street View analysis, uh, moving up and down Sunset to gather what we saw as markers of the boulevard's past and future. Fading remnants, like the stacked tires around the flat fix next door, and abandoned, paint, uh, and abandoned phone booths, as well as markers of change, like the folding uh, chalkboard placards outside of bougie cafes, ATMs, and bike lane signs, um, which are outlined here. So these elements were digitally modeled and recombined in the wall covering that lines the space. We call this wall covering the tableau. In the tableau, some elements appear ghostly and translucent, like they are in, like they are in the act of disappearance. Elsewhere, pieces of the tableau are purposefully pixelated, which we thought of as a trace of digital loss. The tableau is printed on a reflective material uh, so that as one looks through the storefront, the street life is reflected amidst the tableau elements, blurring the inside and outside and figuring the present public into a condensed image of the boulevard. Filling the rest of the space is a floorscape that can be reconfigured and occupied in different ways for different events. The floorscape is assembled from an off-the-shelf data center floor system and covered with custom-made high-density foam padding. So, clearly, uh, this aligns with our interest in the materiality, materiality of media or the materiality of the digital world, but this particular use of the data center floor system also had more project-specific motivation. Um, we think the flooring system has an infrastructural quality that rhymes with sunset and the surrounding urban context. 
By using a system composed of clearly defined tectonic elements, the object quality of the floor elements are meant to prompt comparative relationships with the objects depicted in the tableau. Combined with the traffic cones, foam tiles, and furniture pieces, we hoped for a reading of objects spilling out um, from the tableau onto the sidewalk while the tableau collects objects from the street. And so these are some shots of the install. It's a really small space, about 12 feet by 12 feet by 9 feet tall. And here's a view of the, the tableau, kind of mirrored um, surface. We also milled um, these kind of cylindrical seats that could be moved around the space. We also commissioned a local um, neon manufacturer to, to fabricate some, some lights, some fixtures for the, the environment. And we really love this image because um, you get the reflection of the street on the glass, and you get the blurrier reflection of the street onto the, the kind of mirrored tableau, um, and that those reflections start to collapse and sort of um, kind of play with one another. Shot of the, the interior. And the different ways that the, uh, the data floor system can be um, occupied. And then um, just to kind of note here that the tectonic articulation that expresses the component tree, um, and it sort of makes the, ob the parts into objects. And like the foam was, the foam was milled to, to accept the data floor system, and it's almost as if these, um, these pieces are kind of coming, to to coming together in kind of new ways. And then here are some shots um, from the opening, as well as the space saturated in green with the overhead lights off. Uh, and we also anticipated that the project would have an extended life online through social media. Uh, the space is in a constant state of flux, so each image presents a different combination of environmental conditions and body relationships. So I think I've reached the end of my time. Uh, just to reiterate a point that I made at the beginning of this talk, our practice is extensive, not exclusive. What I presented tonight articulates one set of threads through our recent work, but I hope you'll go into the gallery or to our website to have a closer look. I'll end by thanking our past and present collaborators, in particular Liz Feltz, John Buick, and the amazing Reed Miller for their contributions to the exhibition in the gallery. Thanks for your attention and for allowing me, to share, allowing me this time to share a bit of me with you. Thanks. And rather than have any formal questions here in the dark, um, please head over to the gallery. And everyone, um, all the designers are here, both the New York firms and the out-of-town firms, and can talk to you about their installations. Also, please come back tomorrow night for a second round of lectures at 7 o'clock. And thanks for coming. <laughs>